If you're in the market for investment-worthy bags, watches, and fine jewelry, Rebag is the answer. Rebag is a luxury resale marketplace where each piece is carefully vetted and verified by experts to ensure quality and authenticity. If you're in the market, use Rebag to buy and sell finds from the world's top brands, including Hermes, Chanel, and Cartier. Head to Rebag.com to get 10% off your first purchase with code REBAG10. Shop today at Rebag.com. That's R-E-B-A-G.com. And use promo code REBAG10 for 10% off your first purchase. This is GoPowerCat.com publisher Tim Fitzgerald. Thank you for listening to this PowerCat podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode of the PowerCat podcast by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast network. And if you enjoy this podcast, please consider becoming a subscriber to GoPowerCat.com. We cover the Wildcats like no one else with our VIP customers enjoying one-of-a-kind coverage from our team of professional journalists. And sign up today for an annual subscription to GPC and grab a 30% discount on your first year. And now here's the PowerCat Podcast. The following is a GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street production. You've discovered your link to GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat Insiders Podcast, presented by Commerce Bank, and it starts right now. Now, let's go to the WTC Gig Powered Studios. Here's your host, GoPowerCat.com publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to another edition of the PowerCat Insiders Podcast, sponsored by Commerce Bank. If you haven't heard, if it snuck up on you, you know, maybe you had a long weekend in which you blacked out for about three days. Kansas State beat Oklahoma 48-41. If this is news to you, I'm not sure why you're listening to this podcast, but it did indeed happen. I did not foresee this. I'm sure the other three guys here did. Matt Walters from the K-State Sports Network, Kellis Robinette from the Wichita Eagle, Kansas City Star, and all other forms of media, and Ryan Black from NASCAR. (laughs) Thank thank you. (laughs) From Manhattan Mercury. Yeah, Yeah, Uh, I I picked Kansas State to win last week. I I don't know what you guys did. I don't remember that. <laughs> Go back and listen to the last show. Fitz edited it out. <laughs> I changed it. I changed it. I, I, when he said uh, Kansas State, I just taped over Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, in hindsight, I guess it's not stunning they won. Oh, yes, it is. But hold on, let me go. It's stunning for me how they won. It wasn't fluky. It there wasn't you know a bunch of turnovers uh, that led to immediately points. There weren't a bunch of big returns like when that other coach won at Texas. This was just substance. They were the better football team on that day. They ran the ball. They. They did everything they needed to do. They held time of possession because Lord knows if he'd get in Oklahoma any more time of possession, they would have scored more points. Uh, they just followed the script and got her done. You won't say Ron Prince's name? Oh, well, I, I, can't, I, can't, <laughs> I have started calling him the other coach because I don't want to jinx anything. That other coach did beat some teams and then lost to Kansas. So Down double figures fairly quickly. What What stood out at least early was – not two touchdowns, but a touchdown and a field goal. So you're you're still with an air shot, 17-7. Kansas State's actually doing some things. And when Chris Kleiman joined us on the network for post game, I mean, he, he laid it out. You know, we were down, but we were doing some really good things. They were moving the line of scrimmage. And the next thing you know, you look up and K-State's ahead at the half. And that third quarter, to me, is is still just a blur because Oklahoma wanted, for that 15 minutes, they wanted nothing to do with Kansas State because they were getting hit in the mouth. They were getting dragged up and down the field. They did not like how things were going, and they wanted to be elsewhere. But with that said, going to the fourth quarter, I know I said to myself – 25 points may not be enough. It reminded me of Oklahoma State a couple of years ago, yep. uh, among other ball games. So it, I didn't see it coming. Nobody saw it coming. No, but not really. That, the offensive line was the best that it had been, and we can go on and on, and I'm sure we will. 12 yards, 12 stinking yards in the third quarter for Oklahoma. 
Cullis, that's unfathomable, that offense. Is what Lincoln Riley said today, right? They only ran six plays? Yeah, right? yep. that's yeah. correct. Three, that's two, three nuts. and outs. Yeah, well, that game taught me the meaning of complete surprise, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was – I. I probably could have envisioned at least one or two ways Kansas State would have won that game, but I never thought it would involve them scoring 48 points. If you'd have told me beforehand that this offense that looked so stagnant in the first three Big 12 yeah. games was going to score 48, I probably would have bet just about anything against you and felt pretty good about it. So they came back to life. Not only did they score, they scored on eight straight drives. I mean, absolutely <laughs> murdered them after. I think they went on a 41-6 to six run. That's at one still point. unbelievable. A 41-6 to six run against the Big 12s supposed best team it was crazy i guess i guess we all underestimated how important jordan brown is because when they got him back in the lineup mm -hmm. and used those three browns uh three running back sets they got the edge they were running at will on oklahoma and not to discount the way that Kansas state's offensive line played but having that extra back doing extra things and then having malik Knowles and philip brooks out there at full health for the first yeah. time in a few weeks that all their dudes made a huge difference i I, I feel bad. I really underestimated the impact those guys could make because it, it, it flipped the script script in this game. Well, Fitz, I'm going to completely disagree with your opening assertion that in hindsight it wasn't stunning because I think it still is. Because mm -hmm. outside of, if you if you guys remember what we talked about last week, the only thing they really did that, that we thought that they could do to win the game was they did dominate the time possession. But we thought they would need quite a few turnovers yep. against Oklahoma. They only got the one on the kickoff, and God bless Eric Gallon's soul. And for all, everything that happened with him on that play. A.J. But, Parker's interception, too. Yeah, oh, A.J. Parker's interception. That's another good one. Yes, you're right. But, and there uh, should have been more. Yeah, there yeah. should have been. And, and, if, if Wayne Jones doesn't fall down, the game's over earlier. Yeah, yeah. right. But I, I guess it's like you guys said. There's just so many. I mean, there's so many things that you could point to from this game. But I, I just had to continually go back to that third quarter. It's like you guys said, it's 17-0. Again, and it was something that I tweeted during the game. It's the first time all season Oklahoma didn't score a single point in the quarter. And then the 12 yards, you know, put that in perspective, guys. You know, again, and this is still an unbelievable number. I mean, they were averaging per play coming into the game 9.6 yards a play. A play. Mm -hmm. And for a whole quarter, they got – 12 yards it's just there there are just so many things uh, and I know that we're going to keep talking about but it just it's still to me you know here days later uh the only game in in my head that this reminds me of because like you said we I thought if K-State was going to win the only way it could be was this fluky thing like you said it was like maybe they they return interception for a touchdown at the end of the game or something that just like Kansas winning yeah we well, just something really crazy <laughs> yeah. right but it was the fact that they just so thoroughly dominated the first three quarters of the game, really. Now, again, Oklahoma Oklahoma had its way in the fourth quarter and scored 18 points and, and came within, you know, obviously the onside kick being overruled of having a chance to, to tie it. But it was just the fact that K-State, to me, again, was the better team uh, for the, you know, the first 45 minutes of the game. And like I said, the only sporting event that I can think of in terms of one team being such a massive underdog and having its way the whole game like that, uh, I think I told it to maybe my two sports writers, is the, uh, the UMBC win. Over Virginia. Over Virginia. Yeah. But the, even in that game, the one thing that Virginia did have as an excuse was they lost DeAndre Hunter, who was the sixth man of the year, freshman of the year in the ACC, and they were not a team that could score a lot of points. And so that took 12, 12 or 15 points a game off their team three days before that game. I know that they didn't have Grant Calcaterra, their really great tight end, but I, I don't think that necessarily he would have been the difference in that game for Oklahoma. So I just, I'm interested in you guys just thinking, when's the last time you saw an upset of this magnitude where the, the team that pulled the upset – didn't win it in a fluky fashion. If you can 2003? Think. Yeah, you know, I made that comparison when Kansas State beat Oklahoma in the Big 12 Championship in 2003. It was supposed to be, you know, no Greatest contest. Greatest team of all time. Yeah, no, no one nationally gave K-State much of a chance, let alone pick them. That K-State team was really good, and they just had injuries in the middle of the season that caused a three-game losing streak. But they had, they had a guy named Darren Sproles, and they had El Roberson, and they had a bunch of dudes that could play football, and, and they were by far the better team on that day. But this was completely unexpected. You're never There's no Darren Sproles on this team. There's yeah. no El Roberson on this team, although Skylar Thompson, we'll get into him, was pretty darn special. But what if I told you Oklahoma offensively wasn't any different than what they have been? That's they averaged nine point four yards yeah. a play in this game. They yeah. just didn't let them run many plays. That yeah. number from I'm sorry. Well, I, I was gonna say you guys keep saying there's absolutely nothing fluky about the the game. I will say that the the, the two turnovers were a little fluky. Yeah, the, it was uh, a tip pass. The uh, the tip pass where the guy was I mean Rambo Charleston was wide open. There's no reason that should have been an interception. That should have been a catch. They should have scored there and had the lead at halftime. And then the uh, the kickoff. 
I mean, that. I think that really derailed Oklahoma more than anything when the offense realized they weren't going to get back on the field. That that was the one time when I saw their faces, like when they did close-ups, they were just like stunned. Like, what mm-hmm. in the world? What are we doing? Yeah, we we can't go back in and play. I think that that got that one play. I think got them so out of rhythm that if you're going to point to one thing that helped Kansas State win, that would be it for me. Other than them just playing great. We are sponsored by Commerce Bank. It's where Matt Walters works. You should probably just go in and touch him. Here's Matt. Commerce Bank has the technology, the people to help whatever financial challenges come your way. Commerce Bank challenge accepted. There was a path to victory. It was incredibly narrow, and somehow they navigated Mm -hmm. it. They got enough turnovers. They had none themselves. They only had, what, four penalties? K-State, it was just whatever they needed to do to get this done, they did it. And they were still kind of hanging on for dear life at the end. The number you rattled off a moment ago about yards per play, keep in mind Oklahoma last year broke the record for yards per play, and this year their offense was in front of that. Well, yeah, I know I wrote that in my, my, my pregame kind of looking ahead. It was last year they averaged 8.6 a play, and now it's 9.6 heading into last Saturday. So it's just they've been putting up this unbelievable number since Lincoln Riley's been there. I, I've never heard of a team averaging 9.4 yards per play and losing. But that's what happened. No. They they only ran what fifty three plays in the game. Then that they're not used to that. So in K State had only been running fifty five, fifty six plays itself yeah. the last couple of games because they couldn't well, sustain anything. And lo and behold, against the best defense they faced, maybe maybe Baylor's better. They sustained everything they did. Mm-hmm. It was the two field goals were big that, too. That's yeah. what I was exactly about to bring up. Was if you guys remember in his words as he put it. The difference in the friggin' ball game, as Chris Kleiman said, was was the field goals. Just holding them out of the end zone a few times. Right. You, know, you flip, you flip either of those, and then we're not sitting here talking about a case state win. We're talking about a narrow loss and amazing performance, regardless. And he made him punt a yep. couple of times. It was. Uh, it Lincoln was... Riley did him a favor not going for that second one. They should have fourth and short from inside the ten. They should have just kept going. Yeah, I was... I was really surprised by that. I think at that point he was of the opinion, let's just get points. Let's not. Yeah, I don't let's think not give them momentum. Lose. Yeah, there's no way we're going to lose this. Let's not aid them by you know getting stuffed here and making them feel good about themselves. Because mm-hmm. at that point it just kind of felt like they were going to cruise, and they didn't cruise. They blew up. You know, they just that that stretch in the middle. Gosh, you mentioned it, the forty-one to six. It, it was just almost mind-numbing as it was happening. You're just kind of looking around. It's like, is this real? I mean, they are absolutely kicking them all over the field right now, and that's why I don't feel. It, you know, there were turnovers, but I I just thought K State was by far the better team, and I don't even think Oklahoma looked down, looked past them. They they came out and moved the ball and scored. They took a lead, and then. All hell broke loose. Oklahoma, (laughs) for the most part, especially in the first half, really didn't hit K-State with that big play. I mean, K-State did a nice job on C.D. Lamb for the most part. Um, And, you know, Brooks and Sermon didn't bust the long run. You know, Hurts had a couple of scrambles on third down. But there just wasn't that, you know, that dagger early to to finish off K-State. And they left K-State in the ballgame and – you know, again, like you said, Fitz, K State was they were the better team and I was I was a little taken after playing Texas in the Cotton Bowl and you know, that game gets elevated every year, I was a little taken by how Oklahoma reacted. Yeah. I agree. How many tackles did Murray end with? Four. Four. That was a huge part of the game yes. too. Not only did Courtney Messingham call a bunch of great plays, but they found a way to get get Oklahoma's best player, defensive player, basically factored him out of the game. Murray had four tackles, three solo, one assist. And you look at the guys up front as well. Um, Gallimore, one. Mm. Yeah, was a- How about Sermon, Brooks, and Lamb combining for 12 touches? 12 touches. Sermon and Brooks carried it three times apiece. Lamb carried it once and had five catches. That's not using your weapons very well. But you do like the ball in Jalen Hurts' hands. He's kind of good. I mean, but they somehow got him down when they needed to get him down the most. It was pretty amazing. But let's let's talk about that end of the game with the onside kick. 
It was the proper call. You know, I, I was convinced they weren't going to get it right just because it's, I don't have any faith in Big 12 officials. The longer it went, yeah, I figured it would favor Oklahoma. <laughs> See, I don't agree. I, I, I thought I always think the longer it goes, because originally it was ruled that it was Oklahoma's ball. Right. I always think the longer it goes, the more it favors the team. Typically it does. The, t- the team who did not have, you know, didn't have the call go its way because if, if the call was going to be confirmed, you usually come out quick more quickly. Yeah. In my so I thought it, the longer it went, it was like, well. Overturning it, you got to find a new spot. That's exactly that right. That's All why that. I did, yeah. The reason I said what okay. I I said is because typically I'm oh. on the same page with you. The reason I felt differently was who was standing on the other side of the field. And as I said, as soon as you, we knew it was going to go to replay, I said to whoever was standing next to me, a college football playoff berth is at stake right the, now. I, yeah. I didn't want to bring up the conspiracy theory part of that. Was We've seen it in this I, conference. I, uh, I did. That's I did Mark wonder Reggio. about that in terms of, like, if the Big 12, if there's going to be some, uh, you know, maybe just some interesting stuff going on in the replay place just because they're like, well, hey, if, if Oklahoma loses this game, uh, you know, now we're shifting over to Baylor and hoping they finish undefeated to, for the college football playoff. But immediately Oklahoma became fixated, and I mean everyone, reporters, coaches, players, fans, unbiased media supposedly, that it had been – he had been blocked into it. Now, there was contact. There's no doubt about it. But the rule is for the balls over there, and I intentionally shove you to make contact with the ball. That was not what was happening. So they were trying to manipulate the rule to fit a justification. Set that aside. By God, you're number five in the country. You have to bitch about a, a fraction of a second call on an onside kick just to have a chance to win. You still got to score a touchdown. To get it to overtime, that's really where you're hanging your hat. Not that the team got their butts kicked for the rest of the game. Lincoln Riley could have called time, or could have saved his timeouts too. Just kicked the field yep. goal earlier. They wasted a lot of time there that set up the, that made it nece- necessary for them to get that onside kick. You're right. He, he messed that up. I, I think I'm, I'm with you guys. I think they got it right, though. I'm a little confused on these onside kick things. Um, after watching that and hearing that rule explanation, if I was coaching that as the team receiving, I would say just run out. <laughs> hit the other guys and make them touch the ball early so that they have no way of recovering it. You can do that, but just not intentionally shove them into the ball. So if it's just incidental contact. Well, I'd just do it and hope that they wouldn't call. You do. You want to make – you want to <laughs> – they – and they – the other team, the kicking team, can't start blocking, so they're not supposed to make contact. It's just I, – I'm with you, though. I'm surprised. I, I kind of treated that more as a footnote All right. as much as anything. But, yeah, from the Oklahoma side, it was like the factor of the game that it, that's the reason they didn't win. I – it's an you know it's controversial I guess I think they got it right but that's not why they lost and then they the game. reiterated it on Monday that was the right call there are a lot more reasons Oklahoma lost that game than just uh-huh. that one call yeah there was a lot of uh, I don't, I'm just gonna say there was a lot of entitlement in that they should have found a way to overturn this and give give OU the ball I mean it's OU that's that's what why. I, that's why I sensed That's why that. I had that view. The Big 12 will take care of us, and why didn't the Big 12 take care of us? Well, I think Oklahoma fans are probably still mad, too. Didn't it? Ha- didn't the opposite happen when they played Oregon a long time ago? Where Well, that, if I recall, they, and, and a group of us were discussing this after the game, if I recall, that was the... I think it was the exact same thing. Oregon touched it early. They reviewed it. And, well, no, it, it was a, actually a scrum for the ball, and the ball wasn't in the scrum. I know you guy had the ball. And, like it squirted out of the back of the scrum. And the old you guy picked it up, and he was standing there with the ball. At no time did Oregon have the ball, and a referee said it was Oregon's ball. And this was pre-replay. They couldn't overturn it. Mm-hmm. Literally, the, they're showing the highlights. The ball comes out, and all you guys standing right by the refs with the ball, and they're still sorting it out. Like, I've got the ball. It was one of the damnedest things I've ever seen. And I think that was kind of the 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 moment where they realized they had to have a replay. So in all the, all the talking heads, all the replay or highlight shows Saturday night, because to be honest, I didn't see any. I fell asleep. Because you're old. Late, yeah, late before um, <laughs> had dogs. basketball Friday yeah. night and then early wake-up call on Saturday. But I fell asleep before Tech and KU's craziness. Were any of the highlight shows saying, yeah, Oklahoma no. took one in the chops there? Or? No, no, I mean, I saw one one ESPN guy state the rule and thought maybe it shouldn't have been overturned. But everyone was like, yeah, that's a, that's the right call. That's illegal touching. All right. 
And I think we're all against illegal touching. <laughs> well, I don't know. Last week, that's all you wanted to do. That's true. It was touch on players and things. So we're, we're maybe, big, maybe he meant legally. One, oh, you're right. <laughs> right. Legal touch. Uh, I've said everything I want to say about the onside kick, other than just that it was a great kick. It was amazing. It was like an amazing onside kick. I said to Fitz before we even hit play and record that I have never seen a kicker lay the ball like that against the tee because it was like a boomerang. I mean, I was. It was great. That was cool. I went back to watch the game last night on ESPN. I have a full subscription to ESPN, and I also subscribed to ESPN Plus and told me I couldn't watch it. What, what do I have to have? The secret password here? I wouldn't play, wouldn't play, wouldn't play, and I went and checked, and I'm like, well, I'm not in ESPN Plus. This shouldn't matter, and I signed in there, and I said I wasn't a member of ESPN Plus either. I'm like, you guys just don't like me. Hmm. So you didn't get to watch it. I didn't get to watch okay. it. I'm going to try again today. I've had trouble replaying ESPN games all season, too. I don't know what the deal is there. You go, you go onto their website and you just click it. You click on the replay and it says unavailable. Right. Every week. Hmm. It's like, hey, we've got the game. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, uh, I'm going to find a way to watch it. Hopefully it's on replay somewhere. What was your Big 12's got the short version, I think. What was your favorite quote by player oh. or coach from Kansas State after the game? Oh, you guys are all looking at me? Yeah, you start because i got to think more. Be- I, gosh, I mean, you got there's, the young brain. there's a lot of them, but I have to th- say, if there's one that just sticks out, it was Josh Youngblood talking about when he looked over on their sideline and saw their heads were down and said that he he sensed there was blood in the water, and he's like, yeah, that's why I knew we got this. We got him. Okay. The Wyatt Hubert had the two for me. He yep. said that uh, he hoped this would shut up everybody who thought Chris Kleiman wasn't the man for the job, which I don't know. Were there really people beating that drum real hard before this week? I, I don't know. There's some fans out there that were still playing that card. Well, and, and I well. think he might have also been still referring to when he was first hired, at least because yeah. he repeated that when yeah. I was over there in a little bit different wording than what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, a few guys said that, actually, that mm. uh, you know this should show Chris Kleiman is a real deal. So they, they like the coach. Um, That's and good. then there was also – yeah, he basically seemed to think that OU was a bunch of babies who just lived the high life, and as soon as they challenged him, they were going to fold. Why well, so. well, I said Jalen Hurts wasn't ready to get hit like he did, and, and the offensive line wasn't prepared for that either. For yeah, I, I was impressed with how K-State was physical. That's what they've got to do to win mm-hmm. games. I love Skyler's quote about being late. He spent 20 minutes sitting mm-hmm. there trying to wrap his mind around what had just happened. And he'd been through a lot of emotions, hugging his dad and breaking down, and um, a lot of things went on after the game. It turns out he was doing other interviews before he came to us. We get it. We get it. We're just he was local. like coming to us. Yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, I mean, I was in my. I was in our scoreboard show. Is that how that worked? I was wondering I why t- it was you talk- on the interview. I talked to Wyatt Hubert. Waited for James Gilbert to arrive, and then I once interview number two's on the headset. Then I head for the press box. And Wyatt and Stan finished with Gilbert when I was walking in the door. No Skyler, no Skyler, no Skyler. We're done with the locker room show. And There's Skyler. Lo and behold, I did the Big 12 scores, and here comes Skyler. I was wondering why they trusted you with such an important interview. Because they know they can. Okay. It did annoy me that they let national media talk to Skyler while we were all just in there waiting. Well, yeah. Who did he talk to? Yeah, see, I don't know about that. Who did he talk to? He at least talked to the Athletic. Yeah, I know that. They had a story about it. Well, they got him on the phone. No, they were there. Yeah, well, no, no, they no, weren't. Been on the phone. I was think. it? Yeah, he was doing phone interviews. That's why we, he was so late coming to talk to us. So, boo. Well, I don't gonna, know. I guess that's. You know, what we're going to do <laughs> on Tuesday. At least it was an 11 a.m. kick. <laughs> Did you yeah. say what time was deadline? Yeah. Uh, I mean, like eight. Yeah. So, but, but as I know, I got him. <laughs> as a protest. If Ryan Lackey, if you're listening, we're both. Oh, both. There's four of us. We're all four going to take double portions of the media meal on Tuesday. Bam. Off your plate. Bam. That should teach him. <laughs> Not really. Matt, I want to say about your thing that you were mentioning that, or maybe, or maybe it was, maybe it was Kellis, one of you two, about the, the why it's saying what he did about, well, you know, if we if we punched Oklahoma in the mouth, we didn't think they would respond. Uh, that's a. I don't want to call it a theory, but it's something I've always thought is that when you look at a team, I don't know. I don't think we've mentioned this yet, guys. I'm going to bring it up. Do you guys know how many times and what was the score when Oklahoma trailed this season prior to Saturday? Do you have any idea? Say that again. Prior to Saturday, had Oklahoma ever trailed, and, and if how if they did, for how long was it, and what happened after they got behind? 
I'm not familiar with them trailing. Did they trail against Texas in the Cotton? No. no. Then they didn't trail all year. Yeah, same answer. You guys are all wrong. Okay. That's Guess who they were trailing to? Army? KU got up 7-0. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. And then they ran off 42 straight points on them and said, good night, Eileen. They were down for like a minute 15. <laughs> it wasn't too long. It was in the first quarter. Why did they so, call them Eileen? That's, I don't know. There's no one named Eileen in, on the KU football team. Wow. That was me maybe embellishing okay. it. Good the night, Eileen. What reference is that? That's not the song. Oh, yeah. well, I don't know, guys. I'm, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use the Greg Wood defense and say just because I'm too young to know, it's come on, Eileen, isn't it? Doggone yeah. it. Yes. I don't even know who sang the song. I just know it was a one-hit wonder. Dexy Midnight Runners. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only reason I know about the song was when I watched on like VH1's one-hit wonders about a dozen years ago. That was like number 83. They also had a second hit, Jackie Wilson said, which is a... Van Morrison cover. Next topic. Well, Next. wait, guys. But the reason I brought that up was not to break up, break up the come on Eileen and all that is because, again, outside of that very short span against KU, they had not trailed all season. And I just have always had this opinion that the only downside of being extremely dominant, like Alabama was last year where they went to the national championship having won every game by 14 points, is that when you get behind and you really have to rally – You've never had to do it. And for me, this is a symptom we see at Texas and occasionally we see at other major programs. Not only do you not trail much in college, you have never trailed. Yeah. You've always yeah. been the best team because yeah. you're the best player. You've got good players around yeah. you. You're a five-star recruit. You win all your games. But basically what, what it is, it's expanding from that whole thing where you hear that you were the best player in high school and every team you ever played on. Then you get to college, you're like, wow, everybody's good. But that's just now expanding to the whole team. Right. You realize you're mortal. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been told I'm the best player. So, I mean, I'm not sitting here and saying that if Oklahoma had had any adversity already this season, they would have won. But I'm saying I don't think that helped when they were behind the way they were. They're like, wow, what are we going to do now? There's worse things in the world's fits. It's okay. (laughs) Can we edit out the the by Eileen thing? Uh, Why can't we take that out? Nope. Come on, guys. Your southern charm Uh, adds to the insider podcast. Doggone it. That's just (laughs) – Golly gee. You know what I did learn when I was in Mississippi for for that game earlier? Boiled peanuts are No, Yeah, they're terrible. You just hate (laughs) – all the hate for boiled peanuts is just just – I mean, just unbelievable. You don't say, oh, my goodness. It just – it's tough getting old, man. Oh. Well, I tell you what, why don't we yeah, take a break? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we'll just park a little advertising spot right here. Oh. You're listening to the Powercat Insiders podcast no. sponsored by Commerce Bank. Matt Walters is having a breakdown. Oh. Hold on. Nope. It's uh, ble- bless your heart. Oh, bless your heart. You I've don't heard say that. that. What, you to don't us, say- that's a compliment here. Down south, Tennessee, it's- further south, don't say bless your heart. It's kind of an insult? Yep. Well, bless your heart. See, look at him. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with that, I guess. Yeah, that doesn't seem very far from the truth. Okay, we'll be back. Stay locked in. The Power Cat Podcast will be right back. Getting the crew together isn't as easy as it used to be. We get it. Life comes at you fast. But trust us, your pals are desperate for a good hang. And when they hear you stock the party with drinks from Drizzly, they'll be banging down your door. Let Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery, take care of the supplies. All you need is an excuse. It doesn't even have to be a good one. It's your dog's birthday. The loquats are finally ripe. Whatever. With Drizzly, you can compare prices on a massive selection of beer, wine, and spirits and get them delivered straight to your door, which means you can entice the crew to leave their houses without ever leaving yours. Whatever the occasion, download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details. We now send it back to Fitz in the WTC gig powered studios. Welcome back to the Powercat Insiders Podcast, sponsored by Commerce Bank. We're, we're discussing K-State uh, kicking the crap out of Oklahoma. Okay, that didn't really happen, but it just it's kind of fun to say. The score was 48-41, but... Now's the perfect time for the read. You know why? Why? Life is full of moments. There. Oh. Big and small. Man. Commerce Bank has the technology and the people to help with whatever financial challenges come your way. 
Commerce Bank challenge accepted. If you that. bet the cats on the money line, take all that money and put it in Matt's bank. He's in the vault. His office is in the vault. Just throw it at him. Commerce Bank. You Matt Walters just works it? there. You wouldn't just keep the money if someone nope. came in and threw it at you? Nope. Honest Matt. Honest, honest Abe. <laughs> yep, there we go. Count the gold bars. I'll be honest, I guys. I haven't been as embarrassed about the "Come on, Eileen" thing since uh, I couldn't remember the name of restaurant Tyler. And you guys, are, it's like, how could you know the name of a restaurant? You couldn't remember the name of a restaurant, and you named all of these various menu items. Yeah, it was incredible. A lot of people ended up eating at restaurant. Yeah, Tyler. I mean, I ended up hearing that people liked it. So I mean, I'm glad. The athletic that, staff, Bulldog yeah, yeah. Burger Company. Yeah, that was Matt's choice. And that's where I hope I can go next time. I I uh, maybe go to Starkville for something. I'd like to try that. I ate at Chick Fil A in Starkville. Yeah. Wow. Well, I had a one in Memphis. Way to mix it up, Kellis. <laughs> Way to mix it up. Speaking of road games, off to Kansas. Oh, man. Uh, this weekend, and now with Oklahoma in the back pocket, any worries that this game, this victory over Oklahoma, will linger in a negative way? Yeah, I think there's some worry mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Chris well, yeah, Kleiman and his staff will do everything possible not to let that happen, but it's possible. It, it's hard to. I mean, look at the last two times. I mean, I know it was a different coach, somebody we can't talk about, but the last last time Kansas State beat a top five team, what they do the next week? Lost to Kansas. That, I don't remember that guy. Last two last two times they upset Texas. They turned around and lost to Kansas. So, wow. I mean, it's hard, and this Kansas team's playing good. They've been uh, right there at the last minute of both their Big Twelve games. And uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think Kansas State's just going to hand them a second chance like Texas Tech did, but they're going to have to work for it if they want to win this game. Yeah, I think the two best things to happen for K State after that win, are, one, it is Kansas on the schedule, and half that locker room, three quarters of that locker room, isn't going to look past an opportunity to beat your in-state rival. The second thing, I actually think KU winning helped K State because it really. KU's a much better football team than it has been. And all of a sudden, this offense is throwing up points like crazy. They better be focused because Kansas can score points. KU has come back to life, I mean, in a short time span just because of the new offensive coordinator. You know, the, the, word, the word believe is a powerful word, and there's more of that now. And especially, Why wouldn't I'll you? say KU's offense and they they got problems on defense. Their defense is not very good, but their offense believes, and and now it's like uh, the, the training wheels are off, and Coach Dearman's going to let them do whatever, whenever. And if I don't know if I said it on this podcast, but talent wise, player one to player whatever, KU probably has better talent. Certainly, overall. They've got a couple of really good receivers. They got a great running back. Their quarterback's playing very well within himself. And I think Carter Stanley is maybe the biggest surprise of that team because we saw early Carter Stanley was Carter Stanley. I'm going to turn it over now. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm not going to miss throws. All of a sudden, he's pretty damn efficient and mm-hmm. making plays. He made a couple of throws when I was still awake. He made a couple of throws Saturday night that where he he put it out in front of a receiver – expecting him to be at that spot, and both times it re- resulted in touchdowns. Yeah, it, it was all him in that fourth quarter drive. Yeah. It wasn't Puka Williams. It was him throwing the ball. That's yep. him, him and Deerman have been a very surprising combination, very efficient. Fitz, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want you to feel like this is me at all calling you out. I'm just trying to refresh my own memory. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just oh, did, did, after after go. KU hired Miles, didn't you write a very, I guess, I don't know, scathing isn't the right word, but like salty? Uh, just that you just thought it was a bad hire and no. he's old and it's, it's just, no, what no. are they doing? Okay, I guess no, my, you just seem very skeptical about the well, whole thing. My take on him is. And I don't know now has it changed at all since you've seen some of the season for them. No. My take on him was it isn't his job to win eight games mm-hmm. in year yeah. three. It's his job to get more life into football. Mm-hmm. He's done that. Yep. Get the fundraising going so they can fix their facilities, which are eons behind the rest mm-hmm. of the conference. And then about when that happens, when the talent level rises and the facilities are built, he can pass it off to a younger guy. That he's not the long-term solution. And I yeah. still feel that way. 
Okay, well, no, I guess for some reason I just thought you were very much like, why are they doing this? They're just throwing money to this old man just so they can say, we brought in a national title winning coach from the SEC. No, my take was, yeah, you re- must be remember someone else. Okay. My take there was, was someone who was very, very, very skeptical. It's the right guy. Stuart Mandel wrote a very for their Maybe situation. That must, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we get confused a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Stuart Mandel and Tim Fitzgerald. <laughs> he looks more like Howie than Stuart. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh but no, I think it was an appropriate hire for Kansas. They they needed some splash, but he also brings substance. They had to put life into their football program. I don't think you could go hire Chris Kleiman or Willie Fritz, who I thought was a good choice for him, and really fire up the fan base to the point where you can raise money and build facilities. They have to fix their facilities. They'll never get long term traction until they they fix the stadium, get better locker rooms, get all, you know. And we're not talking new, new paint and. We're not talking a retractable wood. roof. Ah, sure. That'd okay. be cool. I think, I think they should take down Memorial Stadium to whatever the bare minimum is as as a historical building, and kind of replicate TCU. Fifty thousand seats, forty six thousand seats. Live in in the place that you live. Don't live in where you. See yourself. I mean, th- this plan to build 60,000 seats was silly. It was silly. Then. You're going to build a bunch of empty seats. In Lawrence, as soon as basketball season starts, unless you're really good, the fans' attention move elsewhere. Yeah, that's a good point. They could really have like a 35,000 seat stadium. Be really cool. It'd be fine. Yeah. Be really cool. Just be who and, you are. And, and, you know, at that point, it could be more about, like you said, maybe the. It, <laughs> I guess I kind of view it as like the Duke theory, right? It's like Cameron Indoor is only 9,000, which is like, and, and compared right. to, uh, you know, we're, we're North Carolina, the Smith Center, that's 20,000. But you know what? The fans are right on top of you, and it's just so much more compressed that the sound stays in. So just, like I said, I think it's just that people want to throw out the big numbers, but that doesn't mean it's a better home field advantage, because maybe it's not. I would think at Kansas there would be an absolute premium for lots of suites. Mm-hmm. Kansas City money. I mean, K-State can't keep enough suites. They keep... The south end zone is about the suites. Everything else is cool. They are out of suites, and people want to give money. I would think at Kansas, you would build basically a stadium of suites with a student section and a general admission, you know, Mm -hmm. or the big money that wants to sit outside. That's just me. I know. We'll have more fans on Saturday. KU. KU. That's one of their pushes, and I agree with them. To sell these tickets, get in. This, you know they did a Texas Have they Tech cut thing. prices. Well, they did a Texas Tech thing. If you went to bought a ticket to Texas Tech, you, gotta, you could get like a five dollar ticket. Ah, okay. So that was their. That's pretty damn smart. There was smart. nobody there on Saturday. The North Bowl. The stadium's too big as is. You did. There were not enough people in the North Bowl of Memorial Stadium to pass Ryan Black up to the top like they do the football <laughs> when the opposing team kicks a field goal hey, or a PAT. Hey, I am at the peak weight of my life, okay? I mean, I'm not the 120-pound kid that entered college or even the 130-pound kid who was covering Auburn. I mean, I'm like, I weighed myself today. I was 159.6. Yeah. So, uh-huh. you know, there you go. Wow. Yeah, that's little, uh, a pretty heavy sack of potatoes. I got to hit the weight room. I only weighed 158. When I stepped on the scale this weekend. Please tell me you're lying. I know. I'm serious. What? I would have never thought I weighed more than Kellis. I, I, I weigh a little bit more. <laughs> well, I mean, I that's... do too, and I'm ecstatic because I've lost like 17 pounds have, in the last you look three months. Good. Oh, yeah. More to go. I'm not going to get down to Ryan's weight, though. I want to get back to one Kellis is for that matter. You know. So, see, maybe they should be passing Kellis. I'm probably, up. I ate a lot of pizza after that, though, so I'm probably in the 160s again. All right. That, yeah. Will Kansas State beat KU? <laughs> Yes. Yes. I don't know. I don't know no, either. I, I Here's the bad news for K-State fans. I'm picking K-State to win. I've I've missed five straight games. I So you're going to abstain. Yeah, I, yeah I, but whatever I say is the kiss of death. So uh. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I haven't picked I haven't picked K-State so, correctly since the uh, you know, Bowling Green. Yeah. Started too. 2 and 0 and haven't won a game since then. Just my I somewhat Educated, uneducated opinion. I think what K State put on tape Saturday in the running game mm-hmm. will cause Kansas troubles. I agree because we hadn't seen. They did there, there was a gr- there was a great play where the offense. I think it was Gilbert. Forgive me. Uh, K State's 
offensive line down blocked. Uh, everybody went right. And Tyler Mitchell, who was at left guard, Evan took Curl, two steps to his back or took a step like he's going to pull. It was Evan Curl. Yeah. Oh, Evan Curl, I'm sorry. Yep. Thank you. Took two steps back like he was going to pull, and it was just brilliant. Came back. And got in the hole and picked Got in the hole, the made a block 10 yards later. I, I've never there, seen that. I think there is so much more that, that we haven't seen, and obviously there is. But I'm going to go way back to the beginning of this podcast. And what Kella said is I don't think enough people have or are talking about it. The fact that Jordan Brown was able to play and you had Malik Knowles. Yep. I mean, Kate, everybody was available. And I know Malik spent time on third downs and wasn't consistently out there. And what K-State really needs to be hopeful of this Saturday is that by the time 2.30 rolls around, that James Gilbert and Jordan Brown are as close to 100% as right. possible because they got beat up Saturday. Yep, they did. And also, going with that, K-State's using other weapons. They're learning how to use Josh Youngblood mm-hmm. in the best way possible. Yep. They've incorporated Wyking Gill as a nifty little you know, middle-of-the-field receiver that is hard to keep track of. They're beginning to figure out what they have, mm-hmm. and it's all part of, quote, the process. The, the players are figuring out the system. The coaches are figuring out the players, and they figured out how to win a really huge game. And that's still going to take place. It's not like it's a finished product. Yeah. It's going to happen for some time. But I, my mind's blown if they beat Kansas on Saturday. They are bowl eligible. Yep. And the last four games are all bonus. Are yep. all building the resume. The pressure's off. Two of them are at home. Two are at home, and one's at Texas Tech, which I still can't figure out if that's a decent or awful team. Well, you can say the same about Texas, too. Yeah. Really. Hmm? Texas think, is pretty beaten up. Guys, I mean, I don't think there's any question that after the, the win Saturday, you know, it's, it's that whole everything changes now. Because there's not a single game left on the schedule. You're like, K-State can't win that game. Well, not after beating Oklahoma. Yeah. And you saw what just happened to Iowa and, State. And not after what happened last weekend. But the same can be said. There's not a game on the schedule where you think K-State's absolutely going to win. I mean, no, you're right. West Virginia could come in and have the game of their lives and win in Manhattan. It's, I feel okay about that game. Yeah, I mean, that's but the all, one. All the other that's, ones. If, you, if you're going to say there is a game that you're pretty, you're most certain about, sure. it's West Virginia. West Virginia. If you're most uncertain about, probably Texas still, yeah. I would think. Mm, probably, yeah. Because they have more of everybody K-State's going to play. They have the most talent. Yeah. Problem okay. is and they, it's on the road. They don't have any of it in the secondary because they're all beat up yeah. right now among other places. But Those guys might be back by then, though. And, and who, True. And who knows what Iowa State's going to be like at the end of November. You're right. That could be nothing left of them. I'm interested with this next game to see what uh, how this – the direction this rivalry takes without the Snyder effect. Right. Yeah. For so long, he this mm-hmm. was his Super Bowl. It didn't matter what KU's record was. It was incredible. We better freaking beat Kansas. I think. I think of all the losses he took in his career, you know, everybody talks about the the A and M loss, the Baylor loss. I think the when they lost it uh, in Lawrence in two thousand four irked him just as much as any of those. And I think that's why when they came when he came back. I think that's a big reason why they beat Kansas like a drum every single year. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were bad too. So, a lot of people beat KU a bunch of times, but it was it, it was very rare that you even th- thought, "Hey, K State could maybe lose this game." And it's it's different now that I don't think Chris Klein is going to come in and say, "We, you know, this is our Super Bowl." I don't, he's he's not going to say that. But I just wanted to say because we've mentioned James Gilbert and Jordan Brown so many times, and rightly so, but. Man, there were multiple times that third guy, Harry Trotter, yeah. man, he was blocking his butt off out of the mm-hmm. perimeter. There were multiple times of like, hey, again, the person who's going to get the credit for this big run is going to be Gilbert or Brown, but it was it was Harry Trotter who K- sprang him. K-State cut block more than they ever had this yeah. year. They really and did. They did a heck of a job at it. Do you have a rant this week, by the way? Yeah. Uh, we're probably thin on time. You know, potted well, plants? <laughs> I just don't feel strongly about potted plants. I will tell you something I feel strongly about. Bring that. it on. It, it is that, you know, I, I think people know I'm very passionate about driving. The one, one thing I just don't get, guys, at all is it seems like so many people don't understand that when you come to a red light and you can, you're taking a right, you can turn as long as you've yielded. And unless it says up there, no turn on red, you can go. I can't tell you how many times. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yielded or stopped? Well, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Well, after you stop, oh, yes. Okay. I don't mean you just stopped and you know. let let appropriate traffic. But you no. would, but but you you still have to stop when you yield. You don't just 
you know, go through. No, incorrect. Mm. There are multiple stoplights in this town that some really stay yellow a long time. One's on Highway 24 that you get extra time to get through it. And I yelled to me. You're talking about going toward Amigo? Yes. Okay. At that light, yellow means go. <laughs> well, but I, I, guess, I just can't tell you how many times I've been here where, like, I'm, I'm behind someone and it's a red light and there's no traffic coming from the intersecting road and they just sit there with the right turn signal on. I'm just like, what are you, what are you doing? And it just infuriates me. That's, I'm like, that's not my rant. My rant is when it's a red light and then it turns green. Go? And they don't go. Yeah, because they're looking at their phone. Well, or the the second car, like, sits there and lets a three-car gap open up, oh, and then yeah. they go. Yeah. And, like, the guy two cars back doesn't get through the light because you were selfish. Mine is red lights that turn red, and there's nobody remotely close to the intersection. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that's a huge... Just like they saw you coming, and then dink. There's there's someone. Oh the, wait, there's a car. We got to turn right. We're gonna we're gonna get him. But I mean, I just I felt like yeah. getting stuck behind a bus in the morning when I'm trying to take my kids <laughs> to daycare. Speaking now of that is lame. Speaking oh, of down, down, since you work for the Eagle, among others, <laughs> oh last God. week down in Wichita, <laughs> okay, there were there was a highway patrolman, Sedgwick County officer. That was in a bus that was parked and had the stop sign out. So they were kind of like, what's the word? Um, it was like a- like deking drivers had the stop sign out, to, and they were phoning or phoning, pff, talking to cops right. that were ahead and said, "This car, this car, this car," just ran by the bus because the stop sign was out, which you're not supposed to do, obviously. Yeah, no, no. I mean, they like baited. There we go. Oh, baited. Okay. Like baited. I see. Get a lot of tic- they wrote a lot of tickets on that. And where was this at? Wichita. Wichita. No. I think it was on Kellogg. Yeah, because there's no other crime in Wichita. They have to worry about that. <laughs> um, in, in all fairness to the drivers, it, was, it wasn't like they were passing the bus in the same direction nope, the going, bus was going. Right. They were going the other way, the ones I saw. They were going west. And it looked like a four-lane road. Wait, you saw this too? You guys were together? Yeah. No. I was on a school bus with children, yes. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, he said that he saw it. I figured you were with no, it was, him. No, it was on this thing called Twitter. Oh, okay. I didn't see it. I guess I need to look at this. I didn't see it, guys. I'm sorry. It was on, it was on right? Mm-hmm. You saw it on Twitter. Okay. I saw it. Okay. See, I thought you meant you were literally in Wichita for business, for Negative. Commerce Bank. Negative. No. Oh, okay. Well, then. So, it shows you how much I paid attention. I just like the rant. Potted plants this week. Who knows next week? Yeah. I mean, I just, I'm sickened and disgusted by you guys hating on boiled peanuts, so... This shows you how bad I've got um, say, it. I'd say boiled again. Boiled peanuts? Okay, because it sounded like you said bold. Bold? <laughs> B-U-L-L-E-D, bold. <laughs> By the way, it's Clemson, not Clemson, because there's no P in no, it. it's Clemson. So, You're right. Clemson. Clemson. You hear people say that all the time. Clemson. Like there's a P in it. Yeah. There's not. Come but, on, Eileen. Uh, doggone it. We just we need to delete that. For, please delete that. Wait, I just want to make sure we don't get the podcast out saying this, because I don't think we've mentioned him in, other than passing. No, I'm getting to him. But... I mean, cool. Skylar Thompson, guys. How about that guy? Four rushing touchdowns. Hats For me, off to him. You know, we talk about the offensive line, and we talk about other things that kind of took the giant step forward. Better tackling. <clears throat> um, Skylar finally looked confident. Oh, yeah. And back to where he was earlier in the year. He made some narrow window throws in this game that he just wouldn't throw anything close to that the, earlier this season. Quickly. Yes. How many passing touchdowns were in that game on Saturday? Quickly. How many? Fitz. One. Zero? One. One. Zero? One. Yes. Oh, that's right. The C.D. Lamb. Lamb. One. Yeah, C.D. Lamb, yeah. yeah. There were 89 points scored. That's why I said earlier, Oklahoma never hit that. There was one passing touchdown in that game. One significant yeah, play. And what hurts finished, I think, 395 yards passing, right? Yep. So, I mean, I think I've said it on here multiple times. I'm going to repeat it again. Skyler's not the biggest guy. He's not going to be the best NFL prospect if he who never gets there. But man, he is a gamer. He's a gamer. He's got heart. He, he gets up. He gets up for big games, and even when they don't win, you can never question, you know, his competitiveness and his heart. Because I mean, he puts everything into it, and I got a lot of respect for him. That yeah, was impressive. Uh, they have to use him in that running. Oh game. yeah, defenses. You know, you can look at that Baylor and Oklahoma State game, and they were saying, okay, if you're not going to run the quarterback, you're on the record saying that, we're just going to give it to you, and if you don't take it, it's your fault. They're taking it now. His run on that third and 10 from the 14, right before halftime, I'm thinking, okay, they're going to kick a field goal going 2020, and, you know, you'll feel okay about it. 
that quarterback draw when he ran it right up the middle and he was met at about the four mm-hmm. and he got around the guy, that was Colin Klein like. And I think that was, I may be wrong, but I think that was Murray that he got by. Not sure. If so, even more impressive. I don't, I don't know. And, I'll go watch my ESPN. Oh, never mind. And you know what that does is the the run against TCU and what he did against Oklahoma, those runs, what have you, that's going to help K-State in the passing game. Yep. Absolutely. Now they got to account for him more because they know he can take they're off. they're going to think, holy cats, on third and nine, these guys might run the ball. We may get a draw here on third. Get yep, ready. I agree. They converted a lot of third and longs against Oklahoma. Yes, they that was incredible. That is what surprised me the most. I mean, third and 12 doesn't matter. I'm just going to scramble and hit Schoen, Dalton Schoen, on this long-ass pass. K-State was 6 of 13 on third down on Saturday. That, well, I have one last question for you guys. Yeah. It, out of everything from Saturday, and I know they do play this game this coming week, but there's just so much about the Oklahoma game. What was the most surprising? Kel, that for you? What was the most surprising thing out of one thing? I love listening that to they won. Talk. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I what? Know. That just, they won. <laughs> did, oh, well, but I just, I mean, yeah, I mean, a specific aspect of it. You just said how many third and long uh, they converted. I just, because I know what it is for me. If you want it. me to start, it is the fact that they they got back to back three and outs. I would have never, if you guys had yeah, that means that last week on the on the podcast, the only way I would have said, okay, they would have done that because Hurts got hurt and they were, but like I I would have never. No, I, actually, guys, I wouldn't have even thought they could have got two, three and outs the whole game. But the fact they did them back to back drives, that's still just, I, I can't believe it just because of how good Oklahoma is offensively. They did it back to back drives. You got yours? Uh, no. Oh, wow. Thanks, <laughs> Kellis. What a huge cop out. I'm going to give you two. Oh, wow. Two. Look at that. Well, you're taking Kellis's, so well, go on. No, I'm not. I'm not going to take his. I'm going to take his. The fact that it was 213 and 213. Oh, wow. That's a great, yes, great point. And I knew that because Kellis brought Kellis, that Kellis, up. Kellis pointed out. Ah. Number two, and I said this on the air, K-State ran the option. Oh, yeah. That, that was incredible. I wasn't one. sure we would ever see wow. that again. How about that? That caught everyone off guard. Loved it. I mean, and I said on the air, there was a point in time, and this, it's not like this is a revelation, but this was a, there was a point in time where you knew literally every time that the option was coming and you could call it. And there it is. There it was. I guess I was just both surprised that they ran the ball as good as they That did. was mine. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they if you take away the one long run Skyler had against TCU, they basically they had nothing. Nothing. Yeah, no. Game. Zilch. They, and even with it, they only ran for like 90 yards against TCU, and right. then they come out and just flattened. Oklahoma, five, uh, six, it was six rushing touchdowns, right? Six rushing yep. touchdowns, four for Skyler. Skyler had four. Yep, James Gilbert goes over 100 yards. Young Blood had the, other, young blood had guess, the other one. I, Yeah, that three running back set was phenomenal. I didn't think it would work, work out. The inverted bone. Yeah. I yep. love it. I loved it. And you really literally don't know who's getting the ball. 213 yards, 4.7 yards per carry. That was really important for me. It wasn't about that they went over 200 yards because it wasn't about breaking long runs. It was bam, bam. It's four and a half yards of carry. They're picking up first downs. They're asserting their will. They're wearing them down. That defense in the third quarter for Oklahoma was done. 38-08. And touchdowns. Time time of possessions. It was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, I do want to say one more thing. When... uh, they had to put someone else in when Jordan Brown went down and they had to use someone else in the inverted bone. Jax Deneen is my spirit animal. Spirit animal. Yes. He's, he's made a sweet one-handed catch in the game. Yeah, he did. Yeah, it's, it, which is amazing because bowling balls don't have arms. That's right. <laughs> I mean, that kid, you know, I just said when you got those three guys in, you don't know who's going to get the ball. When Jax was in there with, with the other two guys, you pretty much knew Jax was not getting the ball. But then maybe on that day, Courtney Messingham could have given it to him and Jax would have gone for 30. Guys, how do you, good do you think Gene Taylor feels this week <laughs> after that win? He's been smoking cigars. Uh, yeah, why not? Feet up on the desk. Man. So many topics we could cover. Oh, yeah. We will, we will pick up this next week after Kansas State and Kansas play at Memorial Stadium. Matt Walters. Think how Gene's going to feel if K-State wins on Saturday. Get bowl eligible. Yeah. Four to go with beat Kansas. Yeah. They he lost would, their last two games after a big win, so he would only be the fifth Kansas State head coach to win his first matchup 
with the University of Kansas, and Bill Snyder is not on that That's list. Right. Pretty amazing. Tim Fitzgerald, Matt Walters, Kellis Robinett, Ryan Black were the insiders, and we will talk to you next week. You've been listening to the PowerCat Insiders Podcast, presented by Commerce Bank. PowerCat Podcast, all rights reserved, gopowercat.com and Spirit Street Publishing. The calendar has flipped, which means it's time to join us on Fantasy Baseball Today, part of the CBS Sports Podcast Network. Join Scott White, Chris Towers, and me, Frank Stanfield, three times per week in January to kick off our 2024 Fantasy Baseball prep. We're talking rankings, strategy, tiers, prospects, mock drafts, and everything in between. Make sure to download and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Odyssey app, and everywhere else podcasts are found.